Fiona, are we ready? Yes, we are. Okay. So, uh, before uh, I let Roger speak, which I know we're all looking forward to, I just wanted to welcome everybody to uh, Congress. Uh, I know lots of you have come a long way, and I, I really appreciate it. The purpose of the next two days is really to learn a little bit about what everybody's been up to. It's been a couple of pretty weird years for everybody, I think. So I think it's nice also to have actual people here. Everybody's vaccinated. Everybody, this is as safe as we can make it. Um, and I hope you feel comfortable. Um, I also hope that we might find new ways of collaborating with each other. So it's a slightly unusual cast of characters here. And, and Hugh was part of our, what I would call our 1.0 uh, conference here a couple of years ago. And I take it as a small positive sign that Hugh's back. So thank you for making the long journey. Uh, so, you know, of course, now we're here to talk about, you know, mind and matter. Uh, I think the idea is that we have some folks from philosophy, from psychiatry, from neuroscience, from physics, from mathematics. And we're all trying to, I think, in our different ways, understand something that people have been trying to understand really for a long, long time. Um, I think it's important. I think it's interesting. Uh, and that's why a few years ago we started uh, the EMI, EMI Network, which is a foundation that funds research students uh, in Oxford and senior fellows in Oxford and in and, uh, University of Turku here in, here in Finland. And the idea is to build these kinds of long-lasting, diverse research networks, which has kind of been actually my life. I mean, Demis is here, which is fantastic. You know, I, I, we've been working together for 20 years. We, we've failed together. We've succeeded spectacularly together. Uh, and we've done a bit of science. I think Demis maybe more than me uh, together in, in between. And that's the sort of spirit in which we're here. Håkon is here. You know, it's, it's been about 30 some years. So there, and I know that many of you have known each other for a long time. So hopefully you'll meet some new people, learn about some new ideas. Uh, over the next two days, if anyone has any questions about our home, Kankas, I'm, I'm happy to talk, or my partner Satu is probably happy to tell you about Kankas. Uh, if it gets too long-winded or too detailed, stop me. I don't mind. Uh, I'm excited about being here. I'm excited to be here with you guys. Um, of course, we're also celebrating, uh, you know, Rogers. I don't know which to celebrate more, your 90th birthday or, or your Nobel Prize. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's really great that you made the journey. Um, we're looking forward to what you have to say and hearing your opinions and what everybody else has to say over the next few days. So uh, without further ado, I give you Sir Roger Penrose. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I think I should apologize for the first words that I'm on, on my slide here. Because it's not actually Helsinki. But from England, they look so that the angular distance is not so far. But it seemed quite a long, long trip on the, on the bus. OK, now, first of all, in the first picture here, I have two individuals who've influ influenced me very greatly in what I want to say. The left-hand one you probably recognize as Albert Einstein, and the right hand is Gödel. And they used to walk together in the uh, Princeton Institute, uh, or to get to the Princeton Institute, I think. And uh, they must have talked about relativity as well as about logic. And Gödel certainly was influenced by Einstein, and he did do work in general relativity. I suppose that he must have been worried about his own theorem to some degree. I'm just guessing here, because it seemed to indicate that there is something beyond ordinary uh, computational physics, which a point which I'm going to make later, uh, in how the human brain or, or the mind operates. And his work in relativity, he constructed some very curious cosmological models, and they had the very peculiar property, not that there was a sort of rotation in the models, which is a characteristic feature. And he even believed it might be true of the universe and tried to see whether his model matched uh, galaxies and things like that, which it didn't really. But nevertheless, it was an interesting model. And the point about it that was peculiar was it was possible in his model to travel, get into a spaceship. In principle, it would be hard in practice, get into a spaceship and travel small, less than the speed of light but to get back to where you were before, earlier. 
So you could violate causality in a sense that you could, you could go around and, and, and come back earlier than you had left. So this is a curious feature of his model and I'm not sure, he has some curious idea also about spirits going around in these causal curves or something and, getting, and I don't know whether it was meant to solve the problems of logic and how the human brain could understand his own theorem and things like that. But uh, I'll come to that in a moment. But the curious feature of somehow the progression of time not being quite what we think was a feature of the models that he had. That you could, as I say, travel in a time -like, along a time-like curve. That means going less than the local speed of light all the time and coming back to, from, to where you started earlier than you'd actually left. And this was what you could in principle do in the models if the universe was in accordance with his models. And that uh, was something that I suppose he was, uh, thought might have some reality. In fact, I, I believe that was, was indeed what he thought, that somehow if the human beings didn't, somehow the spirits were able to do that sort of thing. Let me not talk about that because I didn't, don't understand that aspect of Gödel's thinking. Um, I want here to talk about something else. It's something I learned from Eric Hath's book, I think it was, Windows of the Mind, Windows on the Mind, I think it is. And this book, he described some experiments that were done by Benjamin Libet uh, late in the 20th century. At least I'm not sure how late it was. Um, and these were experiments that where there was a patient who had to have an operation on the brain for some other reason to what this experiment was about and he was given permission apparently to perform this experiment on the brain uh, of this person who was having an operation for other reasons, a brain operation. And the experiment consisted of having uh, two ways of stimulating, well, uh, sending a signal to the person. One was having a, an electrode on a finger and this electrode could uh, uh, be felt by the patient as, as uh, that finger being stimulated. And the other thing was to stimulate that same part of the brain, which was the part of the sensory cortex, which would be the part which would be felt like the finger stimulation. So if that part of the brain was stimulated, the patient would say, yes, it feels like my finger being stimulated, but in a way which was distinctly different from the actual finger stimulation. So the patient was able to tell one from the other but it did feel like the finger being stimulated, but not quite in the same way, so which was which could be felt. Now, in this picture, we have time going from left to right, and I hope you can see it all very well, probably better than I can at this distance, but uh, the, uh, you can see at the top to this vertical line was the finger being stimulated, and the top one, we see, if the finger was stimulated, then almost at once, the patient felt that the finger was being stimulated. Almost at once, how could you tell what the, when the patient was feeling it? Well, there was a clock with a fast-moving hand, and the person would look at this hand and say, well, okay, I can see where, where it was, and it was pretty well almost at once after the finger stimulation. Very, very little time between the two. Okay, that's fine. But then, if the brain was stimulated at the same point, it would take about a half a second, I think it is, before the patient actually felt anything. The sensation was felt half a second later. And that is that you can see the, the line, oh, I, no, that was, I can't point this way. Oh dear, I've gone and ruined it already. Uh, I pressed something I should not have pressed. Yes, I'm in danger of doing this with modern technology, it's beyond me. Well, I, I'm, I'm doing it, Roger, before, <laughs> before you do it, yes. No, I shall use old-fashioned technology here, which is much better. Here we, here we have the, the brain stimulation, and somewhat later, the patient felt, oh yes, I can feel that the stimulation is taking place. Now, here's the puzzling one. If the finger stimulation took place first, and then a quarter of a second later, the brain got stimulated, the finger stimulated was not felt at all. And it was then only later that the, it, the sensation was felt as though it was the brain stimulation, at this half a second later. But it cancelled out something which ha would have happened earlier, was unfelt somehow. How could the brain stimulation, which took place later, be unfelt, when if it hadn't taken place, it would have been felt? Very, very strange. 
And then this is if you, I don't know what the next one is. Yes, if you, if you have the brain stimulation first and then the finger stimulation, then it is felt. But, but it's very strange that if the finger stimulation takes place first, then the brain stimulation, a quarter of a second later, that cancels out the feeling of the brain stimulation. And I noticed reading back in my book, The Emperor's New Mind, that I gave an explanation for this, which is sort of tongue-in-cheek, which is that somehow one's conscious perceptions were delayed till later on, that when you thought you were feeling it was actually later than when you did feel it. There's a certain puzzle here, because if you wanted to do something with that stimulation, how did you then make sense of that? I'll come to this later. But I want to come back to this later on, because it's a key f feature to what I want to say. But let me not get this machine to work properly. Let me move on now to Gödel. This is the main thing about Gödel. This is the Gödel theorem, which I was most impressed by, I must say. I was... Uh, I'd heard about it when I was an undergraduate, but I didn't understand it. It seemed to say there were things in mathematics that you couldn't prove, and true things you couldn't prove. I didn't like the sound of that. And when I learnt from lectures given by a man called Steen in, in, when I was a graduate student in Cambridge, and he explained really what it was, and this is the key thing. Suppose you have a, a system of rules, I shall use the pointing, the old-fashioned pointing system, R, which are supposed to, if you follow these rules R, it gives you a proof of some statement. So you feed the statement in, follow the rules, and if it says, the rule, following rules, it says yes, then this, then, the, well, here's the point. Suppose these rules are meant to prove things, and you believe that they work properly. But what Gödel shows is that there's a particular statement, given the rules, you can construct the statement. It's of a kind, a statement about numbers, num I say natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, whole numbers, some statement about whole numbers, like you know, every, every whole number is the sum of four squares. That's a famous theorem due to Lagrange. It happens to be true, and you can prove it. Um, there's other theorems like that. Some things people don't know the answer to, uh, like whether every uh, even number greater than two is the sum of two prime numbers. I believe it's still un unknown whether it's true, believed to be true, but nobody's proved it. That's the Goldbach conjecture. Uh, anyway, those are the statements of that kind. And this statement, G of R, is of that kind. So Gödel tells you how to construct a statement from these rules, which has the property that if you trust the rules, that they only give you truths, that is to say, you put your statement in, the rule says, yes, it's true, that you genuinely believe that it is true by virtue of following those rules, that it is a proof and therefore true. If those rules have that property, then this Gödel statement, you can see by the way it's constructed, is true. And yet, it is not demonstrable by means of those rules. So the statement G of R, this Gödel statement, you can see is true by the way it's constructed. But it must be, it's a, it's a sort of logical thing. It says, I'm, 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 I'm unprovable by the rules. But you have to follow through all that and see that it would make sense. And so you say, yes. It, I can see it's true, but not provable by means of those rules. I thought this was amazing when I heard this first. It doesn't show you that there are unprovable things in mathematics. It shows that the rules, whatever rules you start with, and these are rules which you could put on a computer, that's the point about them are, that they're computational rules, that whatever they are, they're going to be insufficient to establish what you can decide by means of your understanding. So understanding transcends the rules, whatever those rules are. I thought this was absolutely stunning when I heard it. It's not that he shows an unprovable thing. Okay, it's unprovable by the rules are, but he shows, okay, there are stronger methods of proof that you must trust if you trust R. So somehow the trust in R is greater than the use of R. R only, by using R, you can establish a certain family of truths, but that is not as much as those truths that you can establish by knowing that those rules only give you truths. I thought that was absolutely amazing when I first heard this. It is absolutely amazing, so, okay. Let me move on with and press the right button here, I hope. I'm now going to say a little bit more about computing machines and people know about um, computers and all that stuff, but the point is basically here, that here is your Turing machine in the middle. This is a a universal Turing machine, any algorithm can be 
performed by this finite system. It's a little finite system. But it's got to be able to call on this potentially infinite tape. You see, this is a sort of stupid cartoon which you, see, you wheel these carts forwards and backwards. And you can call. There is unlimited storage space that can be called upon. You may find you've run out of storage, but then you just wheel in some more and use it. But the logical operations are controlled only by this finite system. So that is the way computers work in principle. Idealized computers or Turing machines. An actual computer, of course, you only have a finite storage, but uh, uh, you can imagine sort of wheeling some more in if you needed some more. But the computer itself, the universal Turing machine, is a finite thing. And you, you would store your, any particular algorithm would have some finite tape on it, and you feed it through and so on. Of course, you don't actually use tape in the modern machines, but the, this was Turing's way of talking about, about his notion of a computer, a universal computer. And I've gone and done it again. How do I unpress? If you tell me how to unpress it, apologies. Uh, tell me how to unpress it, and I'll do it myself. From the bottom right corner. The bottom right. Oh, I see. I thought that was when I was pressing, but never mind. Okay, uh, let me. Just, let me just next to that. Yeah, okay. Okay. Here we are. Now I'm going to give you a way that we all learn at school. I think I hope some of us at least remember what we learned at school, as how you can prove a statement about an infinite number of things. There's no problem about it. You can do a finite number of things to do it. And this is ordinary mathematical induction. Suppose you have a statement P of, which depends on the number n, an infinite number of propositions, proposition for 0, for 1, for 2, for three, like such that every, every number is the sum of four squares. Check it for 1, check it for 2, check it for 3, and so on. And you want to know that it's true for all n. It's an infinite number of statements, if you like, but you only have to prove a finite number of things. First of all, that it's true for the number 0, and secondly, if it's true for n, then it's true for n plus 1. So this is ordinary mathematical induction, which we are supposed to have all learned at school, I suppose. Just, and first order of piano arithmetic is the logical system, which simply depends on this uh, mathematical induction, as it's called. OK, now I'm going to give you some of these things you've heard, you've heard me talk about you know, 15 years ago. It's, you'll probably hear this talk again. You might, uh, I'm sure I've told, told people this talk before. But it's a rather nice example. This is an example you, due to Goodstein, uh, which is a, a very beautiful example of what? Well, I'll tell you. Think of any, uh, any uh, natural number, and I'm choosing, except I can't see it with my bad inside, bad eyesight, uh, 1,000 and something or other. You, Sorry, can probably see it. <laughs> you can see it from back there. OK, take your number, write it in binary. That's not 111, not whatever it is. What does that mean? Well, that means in ordinary notation, uh, you're writing it as sums of distinct powers of two. So the power, some powers of two are in there, other powers are not in there, the ones are the ones that are in there, the zeros are the ones that are not in there, and so it's a sum of distinct powers of two. Okay, that's just binary arithmetic. Second thing is you look at the exponents now, and you write them that way too. So you see the first exponent. I think I should get closer to my screen, and then I can see it myself. Yes, you've got uh, 2 to the 10, and then you have to write the 10 in binary first, you see. So you write that in binary. And then you see also there's a 2, the 3 up there, so you write that in binary. So you've got a bit of a tower here. You go on until you run out, and everything is in terms of 2s. So you, everything is in terms of powers of 2, and then you're finished. Even the exponents, you see, they're all powers of 2. OK, I'm going to, I'm going to describe two operations. Operation A is you replace all the twos by threes. There they are, all the twos by threes. Operation, the number has gone shooting up, because it's much bigger. And then you replace all, sorry, then you subtract one. A is replace all the number, replace by the base by one more, so twos go to three, and then you subtract one. Goes up enormously, comes down a tiddly bit. Then you replace all the threes by fours, goes up enormously. Subtracting ones in line are a little tricky, because there's the handy one at the end, it's just like, subtracting 1 uh, from 1,000, and you get 999. So it's the same thing here. When you subtract that here, you get all the 3s, which are the 9s, and subtracting it from 1,000 would be 999. But it's, the base is 4 now, so it's 3s instead of 9s. And so you've got this. And now you've got, you, can sub, you can subtract 1 from the end one. You've just done it. And then you place all the 3s by 4s, 
and then you subtract one, all the fours by fives, and subtract one, the numbers get huger and huger and huger and huger. You can see them getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is Goodstein's theorem that whatever number you start with, it ends with zero. It's the hare and the tortoise, to beat all hares and the tortoises, if you like. The tortoise is the subtracting one, and the hare is replacing the numbers by larger powers. It always comes down to zero. Amazing. If you'd like to try it, try it with three. comes down pretty quickly. Try it with four. If you try it with four, I would not recommend using your laptop or your mainframe or anything, any computer or the whatever computer you like. I would not recommend using that. I would recommend using a piece of paper and a pencil and a little pad of paper and convincing yourself that with four, it will eventually come down. Okay. It goes up absolutely enormously before it comes down. It's amazing how high it gets. But the amazing thing is that this is true. Now, what's the point about this? The point about this is, if you can see the thing right at the bottom, Paris and Kirby proved that there is no way of proving Goodstein's theorem using, uh, the, uh, using the first order piano arithmetic. In other words, using induction. So the induction procedure we learn at school of how to true, prove something is true for all integers n can't be used to prove this. So that does not work for this. You have to use another method. Technically, what you use is Cantor's procedure of transfinite induction, which is something you can get the hang of. Certainly for an example like this, it's not too hard. The point I want to make here, you see, wh why am I making this point? Well, let me come back to the girdle thing. Some people will say, you see, okay, this doesn't really show you anything, because if you knew what algorithm our brains operate according to, to, then you could struct the Gödel theorem and you'd be in trouble. But we don't know what it is. We have some complicated algorithms in our head, and so how do you use this Gödel theorem to prove anything? So that's the, the usual response I get. See, to me, this is telling us something amazing. It's showing that when we understand things, we don't use algorithms. But people who are convinced we use algorithms say, well, you've got to know the algorithm in your head. Well, this is the point about what I'm trying to say here is that Goodstein's theorem, how can we see this is true by how did this algorithm come into our heads? Well, how does anything come into anything in, in biology? Well, eventually it's natural selection. So it would have come into our heads if it had any advantage to us whatsoever to know about Cantor's transfinite induction, if you like, or something like that. And here I have this stupid cartoon of a uh, well, here we have people in the distance uh, doing things which obviously we're naturally selected for, uh, building shelters, uh, domesticating animals, growing crops, all sorts of things. And here I have some brilliant uh, ancient uh, caveman or somebody who's discovered how to catch mammoths by building a mammoth trap. In this poor old mammoth, you can see the surprise on its face because it's fallen down into this mammoth trap that has been brilliantly invented by this person with a... Uh, Come, uh, an exclamation mark coming out of his head or whatever it is. Oh, a light bulb, that's what it is, you see. Whereas here is this mathematician doing sophisticated maths, and he doesn't realize he's about to be devoured by this saber-toothed tiger. The point about the, the moral of this cartoon is that being a pure mathematician is not a selective advantage. <laughs> I think it's probably still not a selective advantage, but I can't see it in the ancient... Uh, jungle, or whatever it was, or wherever this was, savannah or something, that it was any use whatsoever to, to do sophisticated mathematics. So how could this algorithm have come into our head, which is beyond even ordinary induction? You could imagine maybe induction was of use in natural selection, perhaps. You can see that's possible. But how on earth would this more, much more sophisticated kind of mathematics be in any use whatsoever? So it can't have come about by natural selection, so it can't have been an algorithm. That's what I'm trying to say. If it's not an algorithm, it's understanding. That's what it was, it was natural selection. The general quality of understanding, but that general quality of understanding is not an algorithm. That's the point I want to make. Now I want to give you an example, I think if I've got myself straight here. Yes. I mean, people think, well, how can anything be sensible 
mathematics or a sense of how the phys physical world operates or something if it's not an algorithm. Well, I want to give you examples, very well known examples of things which, you, which are not algorithmic, and this is one of them. This is a, a problem of trying to cover the plane with a, a finite set of polyominoes. What's a polyomino? Well, a polyomino is a shape like one of these, which is constructed, it's a plane shape made out of equal squares, a, a connected plane shape made out of equal squares. And there we have them, glued together along their edges. And the problem is, will these shapes cover the entire plane? Now, it is a, it's known to be, there is no algorithm for deciding yes or no whether this can be done. This was the, the story of this was the, I should say it's not quite the problem I'm giving you here, but it's a slightly connected one about squares with colored edges and things, but never mind about this. There was a mathematician, Chinese-American mathematician, Hao Wang, who proved a theorem to say that there was an algorithm to decide whether you could, these shapes will cover the plane or not, if it were true that every set which will cover the plane will cover the plane periodically. Well, um, one of his graduate students, I think it was Robert Berger, if I have the name right, I forget names at my age all the time, and Robert Berger showed that it, there was no algorithm for this problem. And as part of this proof, he had to show that there were certain sets of shapes which would cover the plane only non-periodically. So only in a way which does not repeat itself. And this is an example I came up with based on a an idea to Robert, due to Robert Amman. But these ideas are, if you take these three shapes, they will cover the plane, but only in a way which never repeats itself. And you can see, from looking at this, when I showed this to, to um, Ron Graham, who, who was one of the pioneers in this sort of area, he looked at this and he had no idea what the algorithm was. I had to explain it to him. There is an algorithm to finding out what the algorithm is. That is to look through my entire collected works and you will find the algorithm is given in there somewhere. I'm not going to tell you where. But nevertheless, that is an algorithm if you want to know how to use these three shapes to how to tell the plane. They will do it, no matter how big an area you want to cover. Just for fun, I'll show you another way. Here, these, this is, of course, a, uh, you, there's clearly an algorithm for this. You take these, these regular uh, dodecagons and squares and hexagons, regular hexagons, and you can cover the plane with this periodic pattern. But I'm going to give you something a little more complicated. You color the dodecagon with these matching things, and the hexagon and the squares, and you can fit them together to color, cover the whole plane. Indeed you can. It would be very interesting to put this on a computer. I'd like somebody to do it sometime, and see how far it gets, just trying everything. This is the sort of pattern you get. If you simply match these arcs, and I think this was, um, <clears throat> the, the, the algorithm is not quite as, as nice and neat as we'd like. These little ones are really circles. Um, and the shape, the size of the tiles was probably about that size, I think. And you can see it produces patterns which never repeat themselves. They almost do, it's rather nice to watch. You can see the thing is almost the same. You see this nice pattern here, get another one over here, and you look at it carefully, it's not quite the same, and then maybe it is quite the same, but then the ones next to it are different. So there's no periodic way of doing that. That's just for fun, that's not a big point in what I want to say. What about the laws of physics? Are they computable? Well, this is really what we want to talk about here. What about Newtonian mechanics? Okay, what about Maxwell's electrodynamics? I mean, it's an amazing thing we read all about Newton. Not so many people know unless you're physicists about Maxwell. I consider him to be one of the really greatest mathematical physicists of all time, and how we're, how we're seeing each other with electromagnetic waves, how the radios work, how our computers work, and all these things depend on Maxwell's equations. It it's really dominates our, our universe, or the, our, the way in which we think, to an enormous degree. Okay. What about Einstein's general relativity theory? What about Schrodinger's quantum evolution, Schrodinger's equation? Well, all these things are computable, except 
they all depend on the continuum. They're not discrete things like what I've been talking about up to here. So there is this question, it is a genuine question. How do you treat these things actually in practice? Well, you make approximations. And we have these wonderful things where people can, with a LIGO, they can see these signals and people have computed what black holes running into each other or neutron stars being swallowed by black holes and things like this. And you know exactly the signals of gravitational waves which could come out using computers to work it all out exactly what these signals would be and we see that it comes out right and everything like that, which is fine. Right in the sense that you actually see these signals just as predicted. And the fact that you're using approximations, does, is that important? I'm guessing it's okay. C consider these things as algorithmic, although technically speaking, you're using continuum rather than discreteness. Is the fact that you're using approximations, is that a key point or not? I'm arguing that it's not, but I'm not going to say poo-poo to anybody who comes up and says to me, no, no, you've got to take it seriously. Maybe the fact that you're using approximations is a serious point. I'm going to continue my argument assuming that that is not the point. There's something else going on. That it's okay to assume that using approximations and get it good enough, it's not, if it's not good enough yet, you can use a better approximation and say, okay, that's good enough. You have to be pretty careful about that. But I'm saying that that is not the point. The point lies somewhere else. Okay, let's move on. Now, you see, I talked about these great theories, but I didn't really quite finish, because when we talk about Schrodinger's equation, this is up to a point what the world does. And you can follow the Schrodinger equation in quantum systems, you can see. They do behave, as Schrodinger says. The evolution of a quantum system very precisely does follow that. But there's a huge catch to it because of what's called the measurement. I'm not sure if this is the right one I want to talk about. No, I will. I think, it, I think so, yes. No, uh, uh, you can read it better than I can, too. So uh, I don't want to talk about consciousness just yet, if that's what it is. The collapse of the wave function, that's right. Consciousness is the issue I want to come to in a minute. The collapse of the wave function. You see, the Schrodinger equation does not describe the world. Uh, actually, if there's somebody, many worlds people in the room here, we have a long argument, but outside, not in here, please. Um, the world that we observe does not follow the Schrodinger equation. It does not, what does it do? Well, the Schrodinger equation, you, you can have a small system, it evolves to a certain stage, and then you make a measurement on it. What's that mean? You wheel in, out of the next room, an apparatus which measures it. And it says, yes, it's this, this, or this is the answer, and then you wheel it back out again. It gives you probabilities. The Schrodinger's equation gives you the probabilities of this, that, and the other thing. It doesn't tell you the evolution of the Schrodinger equation, it tell, but why doesn't it? That piece of apparatus you just wheeled in, that's just another piece of the world, it's, just a, it's made up of atoms, it's the same sort of thing, it's everything else. So why doesn't the whole system follow the Schrodinger equation? Why do you then say it's probability of this or this or this? You change the rules. You don't follow the Schrodinger equation. You collapse the wave function and then you say, okay, it's now an eigenstate of an operator that has to do with this measuring device and all that stuff. It's a different story altogether. It's not the Schrodinger equation. It's the other part of quantum mechanics. It's the measurement part. It's in conflict with direct, measurement, with direct evolution because the evolution of the Schrodinger equation it would say that all these different alternatives um, uh, happen at once. And as I say, if you're many worlds support, they will have a different argument. I don't want to go into that because... My view is not that. My view is that, yes, the world does this or this or that or that, and it does it because the measurement process is something different from following the Schrodinger equation. And here is what I want to talk about. You see, what the old people at quantum mechanics would have said is, OK, maybe an observer has to be seeing the system. That's what a measurement is. Somebody comes and observes it. What's that mean? A conscious being comes and observes it. Well, Schrodinger was very clear on these issues. He had his example of a poor old cat. You put the cat in and you make it do an experiment which puts the cat into a superposition of being alive and dead. And then some people would think, okay, it's a closed box. You open the box, somebody sees the poor old cat and 
that point, the observer's consciousness makes the cat either dead or alive. I always worried about this, but the poor old cat, what about its consciousness? Surely it's got something to do with the story. But still, never mind. I never liked this point of view. Imagine, for example, there is a, a planet way, way over in the distance somewhere, and it's a very Earth-like planet, and it has an atmosphere very much like the Earth, and people talk about butterfly effects, that whatever it is, if there's a storm here or there or something, depends ultimately on, on the flapping of a, a butterfly's wing or something. Or what it really means is very, very tiny effects can make a huge change in what the atmosphere is. And these could be tiny quantum effects. Okay, so if you don't have any measurement, then there will be a superposition of different weathers. So that very distant planet, it's, there's nobody living, there's no planet, there's no people, no, no life, no nothing. It's just got an atmosphere. This space probe goes out several light years. It goes out, takes a photograph of this planet, uh, of its atmosphere, which is a superposition of all different hurricanes and goodness knows all the things. That superposition is photographed by the... It comes back to close enough to the Earth to send a signal, and some, uh, somebody looking at its computer screen sees, finally sees this superposition of all the different atmospheres, and punk, because that's the conscious observer looking at it, it becomes one atmosphere, suddenly. All the way back, several light years, doesn't make any sense to me. It can't be a conscious being looking at it which collapses the wave function. I just don't believe it. Uh, okay, uh, you can still argue with me afterwards, but, but I, I don't believe it. It's not that. There is some objective process. OR stands for Objective State Reduction. You see, it's an acronym. Acronym? Um, OR stands for OR, of course. You say one or the other. It's uh, dead, the cat is dead or alive. It's an objective process in the physical world. It is dead or alive, irrespective of your conscious being looking at the cat or the consciousness of the cat or whatever. It has become one or the other because of some physical process going beyond the Schrodinger equation, which is the reduction of the state. So that's the point of view, I say. What's it got to do with consciousness? Well, you see, the, the people of ancient... Uh, quantum mechanics people, Wigner von Neumann and people like that, might have said, I don't remember which saying what in my slides, I have to go back, no it is this one. They would have said that, um, yes, here we've got it down here. They would have said, no that's us isn't it? <laughs> Never mind. They would have said uh, that maybe it was the conscious being which is producing the state, reducing the states. I say no it's not, it's one or the other because of some physical process and that physical process is not consciousness which does it, it does consciousness. It's the other way around. So it's very crucial that this is a distinction. Is that, okay, it does have to do with consciousness, but not because it's the conscious being reducing the state. It's because the reducing the state makes the consciousness. So that is the view that Stuart and I have, uh, which I'll, I won't say anything about. Oh, I've done it again. What do I do to get that back again? Somebody showed me. Oh, it's that. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> it's quite easy, really. All you've got to do is make it... Even I can learn, <laughs> yes. Yeah, just, that's right, even I can learn these things sometimes. Okay, so uh, it's, the, it's the OR which produces the consciousness. Okay, difficult to see how that could be. Uh, this, in fact, is the, this is the uh, criterion which I came up with, which was already known to Diyoshi several years before me. He had the same idea or they're using it in a different way, but it's the same criterion. The criterion is as follows, and this is where, going back to the original picture of Einstein and, and uh, Gödel walking along, here's where Einstein comes in. In my view, that it is general relativity, when that comes in and makes this, that's where you really have to worry about how quantum mechanics works. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But, um, in fact, somebody should warn me how long I'm taking in this talk, because I, I forgot to bring my clock, which was telling me how far I've got on this. But, um, I'm 39. Yeah. You're doing good. Yeah. I'm doing all right, Keep am I? It. Sorry? Keep at it. You're doing good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, this is the, the, the Diyoshi criterion is, just imagine a system which has got, I can't remember which my next picture is. No, that's, that's showing you. That's what, sure, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the criterion is, suppose you have a system where you, you put an object into a superposition of two locations. And this object has a mass distribution. And what you would say is that 
you take the superposition of the mass in two places, you take the mass distribution in one place, subtract it from the mass distribution in the other place, and work out the gravitational self-energy, don't worry if you don't know what that means, the gravitational self-energy of that difference, and that is what we call EG. That's the gravitational self-energy of the difference between the two mass distributions. For a, a rigid displacement, it's the same as if you imagine two copies of the object on top of them, top of itself. So the object is, imagine two copies on top of itself, and then you start to pull them apart, and imagine how much energy it would cost you, just purely gravitationally, to pull these two copies of this body apart. And that's the same as EG for a rigid displacement. So that's a way of getting some, it's pretty small, you know, even if it was that cup over there and you move it that far, that's pretty small, you know, just imagining how much energy pull it would be to move it from there to there is, is not much in ordinary terms. Isn't it? So you have to imagine that this is not much of, a, of an energy and so the reduction um, which is telling you that it's the reciprocal of that, this is h bar, h cross, divided by this EG, E sub G, which is the uh, this en energy of the gravitational self so energy of the difference between the two mass distributions, and H cross over that is the lifetime of that sin, of the half life. If you like, it's like a decaying particle. If you have an unstable particle, it has a lifetime, and that lifetime, you talk in terms of half life. How, if you have a whole, whole slew of these things, how long will it take for half of it to disappear? And so that's a sort of half-life. And that lifetime is, roughly speaking, there's probably some factor outside this, is H, H cross divided by EG. Okay, so that's the, the Yoshi criteria, and it turns out that the way I did it comes out to the same as what Yoshi said. Uh, but I had this very clear, I hope, oh, gone to done it again. Um, you see, I learned how to do that very quickly. Um, that's Yoshi. Yes, you see, I had this criteria and I wrote it. I didn't quite have it right in the Emperor's New Mind, but I had the right sort of idea, but I didn't have the criterion right, I have to say. And, but uh, I tried to r learn about enough neurophysiology to see, could I see how and where in the brain, uh, where on earth you could see something using this criterion. And I learned about the Hux Huxley-Hodgkin um, theory of nerve propagation. Or, and I said, there's no hope. You see this electric signal traveling and it's going to disturb the environment and there's no way you can procure coherence. So I tried to finish writing my book and I, hadn't re I just sort of rather weakly tapered off at the end saying something I didn't quite believe. And then the book got published and I had lots of rude people saying nasty things about it, a few nice people saying nice things about it. And I got a nice letter, I get crazy letters from people too, and I got a letter from Stuart Hammershot, Stuart Hammeroff, and I thought, is this another crazy letter? He's talking about these funny things called microtubules. Microtubules, what on earth are they? So I look them up and I say, gosh, he's right, there are these things. <laughs> and so I think, gosh, this is interesting. This is much more promising. Could this be a place where you could possibly somehow preserve coherence to a good degree where it would be, have some influence on what you actually do consciously. So we got together and the rest, as people say, is history in some sort of way, I suppose. Which is this OR, OR, OR stands for objective reduction, or one or the other happens. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, okay, orchestrated. That's a little more vague what that means. Somehow the objective reduction has to be collected together in some orchestrated and orchestras works together in some way and how that happens it uses this in a big scale in order to do consciously what consciousness actually does and so there's a real problem about what the orc part of orc are really is but that's it's good to have something which isn't so point pinned down because there's a lot more to work, of work to do to understand that but anyway this seemed to me a whole new area to think about and really there's a chance that was the feeling I had a really good chance of seeing how to make the thing work. Okay, now, general relativity. The basic principle of general relativity comes going back to Galileo, as so many things do. Galileo has imagined him, well, him in imagination probably, dropping a big rock, rock and a little rock from the Leaning Tower of Pisa and 
what Galileo says is if there were no air, he was very clear about that, air resistance would make a difference, he knew that. If there were no air, then they would drop absolutely together. And so if you imagine a little insect sitting on the big rock, looking at the little rock, as far as it's concerned, as it drops freely, there is no Earth's gravity. The Earth's gravity is cancelled if you fall freely with it. An amazing observation, or mental observation, I would say, on the part of Galileo. An amazing feature, and this was the base, the absolutely basis of Einstein's generalization. Make it into a theory, that's the thing. Here you have a local thing, you see, when you consider the whole Earth's field, of course, it's not the same direction all the way around, so you've got to make a theory. How do you have the principle of equivalence working where it's different all the way around? That is a big theory you've got to construct. I'll come back to that point in a minute. But Einstein succeeded in doing that because miraculously, in the previous century, a man called Riemann had created the mathematics that with Einstein could use to make his theory work. If Riemann had not been around, Einstein's theory would have been just a nice idea, not an amazing theory. It was an amazing theory, and here I have, you can see, the Galileo principle works with an astronaut, and here I have a sort of 2001 futuristic space station, and the, the astronaut not feeling the Earth's gravity because this astronaut is falling freely in the sense of being in orbit, falling freely in orbit, and so feels no Earth's field. There could be deviations from uniformity which could be felt, and that's a subtle point, but the major, the Earth's gravitational force is not felt. You cancel it out. Okay, that's the principle of equivalence. Uh, I've done it again. Now you see I can, I've learned things. Now, you see, the principle of equivalence is very fundamental when you try to think of it in connection with quantum mechanics. Here I have an experiment done on a tabletop. And you do ordinary quantum mechanics. Now, suppose you wanted to consider the Earth's gravitational field. Well, there are two ways you can do it. The way that any sensible physicist would do it, they would do what's called put a term in the Hamiltonian to account for the Earth's field. Quite straightforward, absolutely clear what you do. That's the green coordinates. Okay, you might see Einstein sitting in the corner and say, whoops, oh, I should be using the principle of equivalence. Freely falling, there isn't any gravitational field. Okay, I'll use the freely falling coordinates. These are the purple ones. And let's use them instead. Okay, then there's no gravitational field of the Earth. Do the calculation. Almost the same answer. Almost, almost. The difference is simply a phase factor. Who cares what's a phase factor? You use a phase factor, that means the a number of modulus 1, this thing over here. When you do your work out your probabilities and things, these things cancel out, you don't even notice it. Who cares about the phase factor? You should care about the phase factor if you are worrying about not just an experiment here, which is done at the Earth field, but as part of this experiment, you have a mass which is put into a superposition of two different locations, which I'm imagining here. If you do that, well, I should say, the phase factor is not so, so stupid. You might worry about it. Because there is a term here which involves a cubed, T cubed. And you, this tells you, actually, if you're careful about these things, it's telling you that your quantum mechanics is different. So the Einsteinian way and the Newtonian way, you get the same answer, in a sense, but it's different quantum mechanics. It's different vacuum. You're doing, if you consider what people quantum field theory, it's a different vacuum. It's different because what positive and negative frequency are different. You have to be careful about this. But as long as you're doing, keep sticking to the same vacuum, there's no problem. So as long as you don't have a superposition of masses, there's not really a problem. You're not going to run into trouble. The only place you're going to run into trouble is when you have a superposition of masses, and I think on the next slide I've tried to... I don't, you, don't, you can read all that if you like. But what I mean, really, is if you've got a superposition of two masses, then you're, you've got one phase factor here and another one here, and they're different gravitational accelerations, and this means you're in trouble because the phase factor between the two is non-trivial, and you're in trouble because as you move around, this difference phase factor is different. It's a bit like the Galileo thing. You can get rid of the gravitational field locally, but if you want to use the whole Earth, 
you've got to have a big theory to do it because that's where Einstein comes in and he tells you how to use the principle of equivalent locally all the way around and it fits in to make this curved space theory. What I'm saying here is you can get rid of the problem locally if you just had a superposition of two different fields if they were uniform over the whole place but if they're changing as you move around this difference is changing it's like going from Galileo to Einstein you've got to have a theory which copes with it I don't know what that theory is nobody knows what that theory is as far as I know but what you can do is worry about the problem you can say the fact that you're cheating by considering it's, it's all in the same quantum field theory you can estimate that cheat and then you can integrate the cheat over the whole of space and you get this answer and you get the Dioshi uh, you say it's, it's an energy uncertainty in the whole system that energy uncertainty in the whole system is the measure of the cheat if you like that energy uncertainty you use the Heisenberg time energy uncertainty principle and that gives you a lifetime so it tells you like with an unstable nucleus it has an energy uncertainty or a mass uncertainty inversely inversely uh, proportional to the lifetime of that unsta unstable state so what I'm saying is the same here this is unstable and the lifetime of that unstable state is given by the inverse of the uncertainty and this is where this, is where this Dirichlet criterion comes in okay so uh, there's a bit of calculation you have to do with all that and here I have, this is now a space-time picture and here I have a body and this body is now put into a superposition of two locations the space-time it's now a superposition of two space times. It gets uncomfortable, has a lifetime because of the energy uncertainty given by the formula that I just gave you, and it becomes one or the other in that lifetime. This is just physics. There's no biology here. This is physics. You may not believe the physics, but then you have to go and see the motivation. You're in trouble because there's a real problem. It's not something you can wish away. It's a problem. Now here is looking at this problem a little more seriously, and this is space-time picture. It's the same pictures I just gave you in a minute, but just written a little more simply. Here is this lump in one location. Here it's put into a superposition of two locations. Now I'm imagining it's still a superposition, still a superposition, and then it becomes punk. One of them disappears, it becomes the other. It's that one. Now, let's, this is a space-time picture. One of them disappears, it becomes the other. Now suppose some observer moving with great speed looks at this whole picture. Now we have to use special relativity. What's simultaneous according to that observer? Well, observer zero, I suppose, if I've got it right. Oh no, it's S observer. observer. There's no simultaneity problem here because they're all together. But as they get separated, one of them happens before the other. So if this disappears before that one has, you're in trouble because this is gone and this is still in the superposition. So there's a sort of amplitude, it might be there or it might not be there, and so it might disappear, in which case they might both disappear. That's rubbish. What about this observer? It's even worse here, because here, this one, they're both around. Um, this one has disappeared first. It might have disappeared. This one, you don't know if it's going to disappear. No, I've got it the wrong way around. This one has disappeared, sorry. That's right. And then you don't know about this one. It might have disappeared too, so the whole lot might have gone. That doesn't make any sense either. So it's still got to be a probability all I'm saying is that the picture doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense unless the reduction is taken here rather than here. If this actually disappeared at some point, I should say there is another answer to this problem. There's another answer is that it just doesn't disappear punk, but the amplitudes, you see they usually don't mention these amplitudes, but I should mention them now. When it's a superposition of two places, it's not here plus here, it's something times here plus something times here and these are complex amplitudes if you do your quantum mechanics right you see it's not here and here at the same time it's some complex number times here plus some complex number times there and then when this one gets much bigger than that one then you say it's more or less over here and there's a whole body of theories called CS models which sort of say the sort of jiggle around and then one becomes bigger than the other and when it becomes so much bigger than the other it's become this one they're rather nice models but they don't work for an interesting reason which I can't give you because it's going outside what I could tell you an argument due to Sandro, Di Dioshi, uh, Sandro Donal Donardi 
And he got hold of me explaining this idea, and I thought it was an amazing idea. And I developed it and said, well, look, it shows all CSL models must be wrong. And he didn't like that. <laughs> I won't go into that, but I'm just saying these are theories which tell you that it doesn't, just one doesn't disappear and the other one becomes there. Is that somehow one of them fades out. And when the fading out is big enough, it's a thing called the gambler's ruin. You see, you, they're gambling, playing this game with each other. And when the probability becomes so much bigger on one side and the other, oh, well, you might as well say it's collapsed. But the argument doesn't work because of this argument due to Donadi, which if people want to ask me about that afterwards, I'm I'd gladly talk about it. But it's not something I should mention here because I'm sure I don't have the time to say it. In fact, how much time do I have? I think you're still doing really well. I well, I'm not quite finished. Yeah, so you're yeah, not... Exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so what I'm saying is that this doesn't work unless the reduction happens here. That's crazy. But what you have to have to make sense of it is this picture. Now this picture I'm going to try and explain. It's the same sort of picture we had before. Here we have, a, well look, look at the bottom. There is a laser shooting a single photon to a beam splitter, a half silver mirror, whatever you like to think about it. So the photon state is split into going down and going along horizontally. So it's similar superposition of these two. The part of it which is going horizontally hits this lump of material, the impact starts to move it. But it's only a superposition of going this way and going down, so the lump is in the superposition of being moved and not moved. So here, as the time goes up, you can see the, the, the superposition is getting more and more displaced as you go on. The space-time is getting warped a little by this, so the space-times are getting a little different from each other, a little different. And now, this is the OR criterion, this is about when you would expect it to collapse into one or the other. And what I want to describe here is that there are two types of reality which one considers. One is quantum reality and the other is classical reality. And the distinction between the two, it's a quite clear ontological distinction. The distinction is one, classical reality, you can ask the state, you can say, okay, what's your state? And it'll say, okay, my state is such and such. Fine, thank you very much. That's classical reality. If it's a nice, clearly curved space-time, you can say, what's the space-time like? You can say, yes, I'm curved this way. Thank you. Quantum reality is different. You can't ask it a question like that. What you can ask, you can say, my theory tells you the state ought to be such and such by now. I think it should be such and such. Let's try and make a measurement. If, this is Einstein's criterion, if the state, according to quantum mechanics, if the state says, yes, you are right, my state is what you're suggesting, with certainty, that gives it a quality of reality. So the Einstein concept of reality is that. You can confirm it with absolute certainty. That is to say, if you repeat the experiment many, many, many times, each time it definitely comes out, yes, you're right. If it's not quite right, you maybe had it pretty good, but not quite right, occasionally it will say, no, you're wrong. So Einstein says it's real, it's, this is a real truth about the world, it's a real thing about the way the world is, if this Einstein criterion for reality is satisfied. That an experiment, you know this experiment is right, and it says, yes, you're right, with certainty every time. That's quantum reality. You can check on it. Classical reality, you can ask what the state is, and it'll give you the answer. Quantum reality, you can check whether it's right. Very clear distinction. In this picture, you see the two realities. Here is the classical reality, is the space-time. Well, it's the quantum reality, is the superposition, and you can check here which it is. The classical reality, suppose it's gone whichever way it is that's moving it, then it's that one. And then you say the, the space-time was this all the time. So it's, although this was where the choice was made, it was doing this, as though that all the time it would be doing that. And this branch has died at its birth. That's the point of view. Whereas the quantum superposition, but it dies at birth because it was the other one. If it had turned out like this one, then this one had died at birth. Okay, that is the picture. And now I want to go back to, if I press the right button, let's make sure I see it. This. Now what I'm saying is that this is really true in some sense because let me go back to this earlier picture if you like. You see, here is where, according to the Orko R theory, this is where consciousness is. So you say, okay, I consciously have perceived or 
whether decide, whichever it is, perceive or decide, that it is one rather than the other. And it's, you said it's that one. So it's as though that one was that one all the time. So the idea is that quantum superpositions, it could be whatever it is, and Stuart will have to work it out for me, quantum superpositions of different actions can be there waiting in superposition for the decision to be made. Then the decision is made, and then retroactively, in a certain sense, it was that one all the time. Okay, that's the idea. That it's very strange, but the argument is, and most of the things I was saying was physics, so to me that's got a pretty sound foundation, but uh, one would have to worry about these things, of course. Going back to this experiment, so what I'm saying, I think I've lost the thing at the top for some reason, um, I'm not sure I can bring it down. But, uh, it doesn't matter, yes. I, I, I fixed it at the earlier picture, but this one has got... Can go back to the first picture? Yeah, just you can go back to the first one. It's, uh, the very, it's not the very first... Yes, it's the second picture, right after the picture of Gödel and Einstein, or the third one. Yeah. I could have done it on here, couldn't I? I could have flipped through a lot. <laughs> Yes, that's it, thank you. Okay. Now here you can see, uh, see what it is. Now you see here, we have the finger stimulation, and because the brain stimulation happened later, it's pointing out that you haven't felt it yet. And according to this picture, the patient has not felt it yet. That's true. The later feeling, um, if that hadn't been for the brain stimulation, would have referred back, so anything which was done with that experience could have happened earlier. You see, it, this goes back to things which I, uh, one of the nice things about getting a Nobel Prize is that I, one of my old school friends that I hardly knew before, that, that was John Barrett, and he became a big knob in, in uh, Wimbledon and everything, and he said, come and watch uh, Wimbledon, you see. So I went, and I took my son, and we went, watched, and we watched Federer playing a game, and it, it was absolutely stunning. And he got beaten in the next round. He wasn't so good the next round. But, but that time, he, he was, you could see, he's making a choice. And he's, you don't know what he, he, you certainly don't know. He probably doesn't know yet whether he's going to hit the ball down the line or cross court. And he's probably made an instant judgment, OK, I'm going to hit it cross court, because of what he's seen, and he makes his conscious judgment much too quickly from just imagining the nerve signals and what... See, Neurophysiologist was oh, it's so fast it has to be done unconsciously. It couldn't be conscious. But the view is, it was done consciously. And then the alternatives of what that conscious decision, somewhere in the operation, and Stuart will have to tell me where, in this operation, the choice was to make to hit a cross court, and it was waiting. The two alternatives were there, waiting to be made, and retroactively that decision referred back, going back to this branching of the two space-times to that one in which it was cross court Okay, this sounds crazy, but it seems to me, from things like this, as far as I'm aware, nobody has refuted these experiments, and as far as I'm aware, nobody's repeated them. Is that right, Stuart? No one's repeated them, either. Uh, no, we don't do uh, uh, brain surgery under local anesthesia very often, so it's very rare. Yes, I, I mean, see. Uh, you numb up the skin, the scalp, the, the skull, and, and, and the meninges, and you can get to the see. brain while the patient's still awake. Yeah. That's not done very often now. Well, I gather there was some, maybe, a, a reason people didn't like doing this kind of experiment. There, there's other evidence for uh, backward, backward time effects. Okay, well, that, perhaps you can, you can tell us these afterwards. Quite a number of them. But yes, it seemed to me, uh, I mean, this worried me already in writing The Emperor's New Mind. But I didn't think about the, it, you know, if it's got to go go back to what the person does. I mean, I've finished my talk, so this can be question time, yeah, if you like. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, you can go back to... Uh, to um, uh, sorry, I forgot what I was saying here. But it's certainly... Uh, uh, the, the fact that it's wiped out... The thing is, in this picture here, yes, indeed, it's not been felt yet. That's why the patient does not feel it, because this thing has gone and wiped it out, because it hasn't actually been felt yet. If it had been felt later, and then transferred back to some action that the person might, achieve, might do, that's fine, because according to this retroactive picture, you can do that. So long as the alternatives were in quantum superposition, and had the choice classically had not yet been made, 
I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting distinction. I was, I was hearing a talk on the radio about this chap, Eagleton, da da David Eagleton, was he? And he was talking about people falling down and have their things flush. You know, they, they think they're going to die, and so, so uh, different uh, memories flash through their mind. How could they have enough time to think about that? And the idea here is, is they don't think about it then, they think about it afterwards. And then it's referred back to as though it was when they were falling. You could test that experimentally by knocking them out when they got to the bottom. And if you knock them out, then they wouldn't have had the experience yet, so they wouldn't know it. And there must be experiments, okay, not quite like that, which you could perform, which would test that idea. There have been a number of, uh, a lot of them are in the so-called parapsychology literature and therefore don't get taken seriously just because, but, but there's one series of experiments done by a guy named Gerald Bem in uh, uh, a, a mainstream psychology literature in, uh, in tw about 2012, and uh, he showed uh, so-called uh, retroactive effects, uh, pre precognitive effects that were pretty solid. I see. Um, and it was a mainstream journal, so... Uh, Interesting, yes. Uh, no, I think of course, everybody ignores them after that. Well, I think the trouble is that everybody's going to poo-poo it, you see, because it's just crazy. But just because it's crazy doesn't mean it's wrong. <laughs> I agree it's crazy. The world is crazy. Quantum mechanics is crazy. General relativity is pretty crazy too. But a lot of these things turn out to be pretty correct. Let me just say that without this back in time effect, uh, real time conscious control and free will is impossible. Because the, the activities that where we perceive something happen in the brain after we've already responded. So without this, we have to conclude that we're acting non-consciously and have this false illusion of consciousness. I'm sure. Being, right. uh, and control. I should point out, it's not just in ping pong and things like that. It's ordinary conversation. conversation. Two people talking to each other. Yes. Are they just unconscious all the time when they speak? And, uh, and don't forget that the sportsman would say they've got to be in the zone. They've got to be in? In the zone, which is a sort of their way of showing that they're not thinking about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're just <laughs> responding. No, I that is unconscious, probably. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But that may not actually be unconscious. Yes. Yeah, that's just a way of describing yeah. the mental state. Yeah, but it's different from, say, trying to work things out logically, as, as we are around the table now. These guys have got to react. Yes. And it's, somehow it's a, that, it's all going on. But they have the perception that they're, they're doing it consciously. Yes, I think, yeah. uh, they, I think Basil is making a, a different point, which is an important one. Now, you know, people are so prejudiced because they've got certain fixed ideas about what must be true. If they just yeah, so, and, and that's the words they have to use. They yes. can't use ordinary scientific words, so they have to invent. Yeah, I think, I it's think, in the process, it's, yeah. it's in the zone, it's that kind of... Yeah, no, I think but clearly there's some conscious control in what we talk about. Well, I mean, even now, just talking to and fro, according to the ordinary, I guess, um, view of, of, of what people, I mean, if you don't have something like this, you're in trouble with ordinary conversation. Yes. We're not a specialist on conversation here, Mark. No, I'm not a specialist on conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there are, there are certain sort of interesting things about conversation. Mm -hmm. For instance, the typical break when people sort of t take turns, when the turn changes, you know. It, that's typically like 200 milliseconds, and when you start speaking, you, it means that 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 what you're going to say, you've been sort of planning that, including the sort of motor yeah. gestures before and while you're listening to the other. So 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 in that sense, when we when we speak and when we when when we speak together, it's it's uh, sort of weird thing in terms of consciousness because because basically you are listening to yourself speak most of the time you're not you know yeah, like, no, I take that, it, yeah. It, yeah so it's a now I think it's a, probably a mixture uh, that's right I mean a lot, a lot of things are pre-programmed -pro reactions and things uh, maybe as Basil says because of your prejudices and so on I also think about about uh, comedic pro funny programs on the radio and, and when, when the joke comes, people laugh very, very quickly. Now, is that purely an unconscious response, or are they actually seeing the funny thing and, and laughing because they've appreciated the joke? 
I mean, is that something which is purely unconscious and nothing to do with, it, with it being aware have, of it? I don't you believe have, it. You have comedians hired to actually get the audience into the excited state, yes. and then the broadcast goes out. So he's already prepared the audience for yes. laughter response, as it were. That's true. Yeah. I think Joseph's got it. Do you got something there in the back? I have a question, but it, it shifts the subject. To go back to go. Okay, back to go. Oh, back to go. go back to Five, back to yes, yes, go on. So, I, I wanted to make an observation. I can't see it. Can you see me? Uh, uh, so, Roger. Um, oh, okay, yeah, yes. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter because uh, I can't see you anyway. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I put my glasses I, I on. I have an observation a bit. and then a question. Yes. It's about what you call amazing. <laughs> so, I, I don't want to question whether uh, Roger Federer is amazing or whether general relativity is amazing. I, I probably think they're not. And, and amazing just means I can't do it. I, a normal person, wouldn't come up with it because I'm not Roger Federer. But, That's all right. but, but there's, a, there's just nature going on in Roger Federer, and there's nothing amazing. Um, but you call that amazing because you don't know what it is. Mm. Yeah, so I, I want to I wanna, uh, I wanna give an instance of this by uh, recycling back to good. Okay. Uh, because you kept saying how amazing it was for you as an undergraduate and so forth, and everybody says that. And um, I, I did not have this experience, so, so maybe something's wrong with me. Um, I think it's deeply true what you described, and we're going to talk in the afternoon, some, some talks here about the Gödel theorem and incompleteness and so on. But I just, I just want to say um, one observation and then a question. The observation is you talked about mathematical induction which is there a key to uh, the emergence of incompleteness. Mathematical induction, uh, as used in piano arithmetic, is already a restriction, a limited form of true mathematical induction that we study in high school. Because in high school, in elementary uh, school, we say for any property of natural numbers, if it holds a zero, if it holds a n, if it holds a n, n plus one, therefore it holds a all numbers. And what you refer to as that by conduction is a first order scheme that looks only at open sentences of first order language, the numerably many such formulas, and it's not full mathematical induction. It's not? You know, it is not full mathematical induction. Uh, mathematical induction, even something weaker than full mathematical induction, would give you uh, uh, the, the examples that are true but not provable, namely the following rule that every schoolboy understands, but is not a finite rule which is if some property f holds a 0, and it holds a 1, and it holds a 2, it holds for all natural numbers. And mathematical induction, as formulated in PA, does not, is a finite rule, it cannot get at that. So I didn't understand. If you say it's true for 0, and it's true for 1, and it's true for that kind of rule. The, it's called the omega rule. Uh, it's, the, it's that if, uh, uh, so any, for any property of natural numbers, f, if it holds a zero, if it holds a one, if it holds a two, dot, dot, dot. Yes, but it, what do the dots it, mean? I'm sorry? What do the dots mean? Yeah, that's the problem. That, that the first order mathematical induction using PA doesn't get at the dots and allows non-standard models, which are used by Paris and Kirby and all these, these things. So I, I just want to say, if we take natural modes of reasoning that high school kids understand, that Dedekind understood, that Scholar understood before good, and we restrict it to a very reductionistic uh, finite theory, then it's not amazing. It would be amazing if it weren't like that. Um, then there's, of course, techniques inside the journal, how to get a particular kind of statement that Hilbert would approve, and so on. But the idea that there would be truths of arithmetic, like the Goodstein, we're going to talk this afternoon about Goodstein, which is not about self-reference, which is not about coding, just a, an ordinary sentence about sequences of natural law. Um, suggest, and I, I want to get to the general point of this, suggest that transfinite induction is the natural rule that we all understand. And here there was a reductionistic project, optimistic, to take a very strict rule, that's a reduction, and get just a bit what naturally would be gotten from transfinite induction. And that leads to the general observation about non-amazing um, so I, I think of myself, for instance, as a restriction of Roger Federer, who's not amazing, he's nature at its best, and I'm just a restriction that's fucked up, so to speak, in terms of playing tennis, right? So what I would like to suggest um, is that we have this, uh, 
a, a very good example of what I'm after here, if, if you can comment on this. It, it, and this is about good. No, I, I, I don't understand enough of physics to, to make the, the jump to the physics case. But I have a suspicion that it's similar. Um, for 2,000 years since Aristotle, people said that, uh, you spoke of Galileo, that the 1-1 one, one correspondence between 1, 2, 3, 4, the full natural numbers, and the even numbers, 2, 4, 6, is a paradox. They call it even Galileo's paradox. Break it down. It's amazing. If infinity doesn't make sense. Cantor and Dedekind came in the 19th century and said, it's not amazing at all. It's the definition of what it is to be an infinite collection. You just were presupposing something about finite collection that doesn't generalize. And, and this is the, the tone of my question, so to speak. Um, maybe Gödel's results are not that amazing. Gödel's colon, uh, uh, Woody is going to talk about, I'm sure that's the continuum hypothesis as being independent of ZFC, another amazing result. Um, maybe there is a presupposition that we make in reductionistic uh, projects, Hilbert did, and, and Gödel was part of this in a certain way at the, at the initial phases, that we can get away with something very, uh, you know, small, complete, literal, finite, theory. And, and that's amazing, that people make this assumption that a very weak theory will do. That seems to me amazing. Uh, you know, uh, people say, uh, you, you've written about this, um, Tarski's paradox, the liar's paradox. Tarski's it's not a paradox, that is a little theorem, that you cannot define a certain predicate in a first order language. That's a theorem, there's no paradox to it. So, so I have a funny feeling that we are overselling to the ordinary daily, to the San Francisco Chronicle or whatever, that there's an amazing thing going on, but in fact it's, it's a byproduct of how truth by nature is, and we have taken a step of a reductionist, and, and then we're amazed that it doesn't work. Can I respond? Yes, I'm sorry. And, uh, I think you're just complaining about my use of the word amazing. I'm not going to retract it, because I do... When I say amazing, I'm talking about things when I first learn it. Okay, m maybe I see this thing many times, and I, when, I, I've looked at the girdle thing a hundred times, and by then I'm bored with it. It's still amazing because the first time it was amazing, and that's good enough for me. Now, amazing to me is where you learn something quite new, which you hadn't perceived was potentially there, if you like. I'm, the girdle thing, I can't let you talk me out of it being amazing. I think it is amazing. And I think general relativity is amazing, and don't quite know why you're complaining about that. But this is just a use of words, as far as I can make out. It's, it's, not, it's not so easy to amaze you as it is to amaze me, perhaps that is. Is that the answer? No, no, let, let me just add a word. A word as long as it's only a word. I, I do not try to put down these grades and down my heroes for actually stating something that's not amazing, that's very deep. Um, look, here's a simple argument that a mechanical system, a logical argument, I think logically valid argument, that first of the logic which is built into piano arithmetic cannot do. There are at most premise, one premise, there are at most 25 people in this room. Um, therefore, there are at most finitely many people in this room. Everybody in this room understands it. People who are 10 years old understand it. It's a logically valid argument, but it cannot be proved in first order logic because it cannot express the idea of finitely many because of this weakness about, you know, we, we want to get something, so we give up the expressibility of something. And that applies to the natural numbers. If we didn't use piano arithmetic, we could characterize the natural numbers. There would be no non-standard models, because we would say about each number in the model that, that, that it has finitely many predecessors. But we can't do it because we've elected a very weak system for, for our own you know, reductionistic reasons. And that's what I mean by it's not amazing, it's to be expected. Well, I can't see anything you've said contradicts anything I said. It's true. It's yeah. just you're, you're just using what a different word. Yeah. That's all. I mean, I, I happen to like the word amazing because it does describe my feelings for these things. Okay. And if you don't like it, you can use a different word. Yeah. No. I, I, can I add a comment? Yeah. Slash a question is that I think maybe maybe what what's being discussed here is that we we uh, we easily confuse modelization with experience. So experience, I think, is as it is, uh, and 
whatever the words we choose to use, our experiences is, like I think everybody pointed out here, up to us. Uh, I think maybe what Joseph is trying to point out, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe what you're trying to point out is that we, we have some models that we've, we've come across over the years and centuries that have been incredibly successful in certain contexts. Mm -hmm. And that has then kind of start, started us down a path of saying, hey, surely these modelizations should be ever so successful in covering whatever experience we've had. And I think that in, in that sense, I think it is interesting that we, we've sort of maybe forgotten the origin of experience is something that may or may not be modelizable. And there may, may or may not be a process involved in modelizing experience. And you know, maybe there's a way to look at the question the other way around, of saying, here's experience. It is what it is. Yeah. Uh, here, here are modelizations of that experience. You know, do, do they cover experience? I'm not sure if I'm capturing Absolutely. all. Absolutely. Much better than how the long-winded way I think. So it's, yeah. I actually also share, Roger, your amazement with, <laughs> and, and, uh, but it's sort of amazing to me that sort of a finite story covers almost, if not maybe all, of experience. That's the part that amazes me. Yes, well, it's, it's usually yeah. the thing you, you've learned to live with certain types of things which work well, and then yeah. when you realize that that's not completely, that you can, that other things which don't exactly necessarily contradict it, but so you give you a different way of looking at, at the world. I mean, sure. And actually, you're doing it a little bit yourself, because what you're doing is you're taking quantum mechanics, and then you have a view, and then you add to it gravity, and you kind of gravitize quantum mechanics. And actually, it's not no longer the same old finite story exactly. that we had. It's, yeah. it's the new Rogerified, new, slightly larger <laughs> finite story. Although yeah. I don't know how to think about the size of these things. Well, we don't have it. It's, just, it's a bit like, I was saying, it's a bit like Galileo saying you can get rid of gravity locally. Yeah. You need and Einstein you need to say how to do it. And here it's the same thing, basically. Yeah. Locally, you can see the, this sort of contradiction yeah, with the, with the with the phases and all that yeah. stuff, and then you have to have a way of seeing how to do that globally. That's the big thing. That's the Einstein who needs to come along and tell us how to make this into a proper theory. And it's in the way the the yeah. sort of the and in fact I'll talk about this later. Sort of the genealogy and origins of these things that yeah. is amazing the, yeah. in, in my mind. I think it is amazing, and I think one the amazing the feeling of amazement is a really important feeling to have. Well, but, I think without the feeling of amazement. We wouldn't do anything. Yes, absolutely right. Yes. Because it would be obvious. Yeah. I think Ross got a question. Well, I just, I just feel obliged to point out that, um, if there, are, as Stuart pointed out, there are lots of these uh, psychological phenomena that are, they're not contra they're not considered to be uh, non-mainstream. They're not considered to be uh, alternative. They're, 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 they're accepted psychological fact about perception and backmasking. Libet's uh, yes, studies, yes. although I don't know if they've been replicated. Um, a color five phenomenon, which I could explain, the cutaneous rabbit. I could, I could actually demonstrate that one to uh, to a subject. Perhaps um, it's an example of where you have this kind of phenomenon about the reported experience, the some uh, discom or incompatibility between the time course of the experience reported and the time course of the events that cause the experience. But there are standard explanations that don't require us to violate. Uh, our normal notions of cause and effect, as you are asking us to do. For instance, with, mm, with Libet, they would say, well, the cortical stimulation uh, destroys the memory of the experience. So if the experience is sufficient mm. for, uh, if, if the st sensation, the stimulation is, exists, is sufficient for sensation without the cortical stimulation, then yes, that sensation occurs, but um, there's no longer access to it because the cortical stimulation um, overwrites that memory or prevents that memory getting put into long-term storage. Uh, you know, it only, only retain, it's kept in the yeah. working memory and not... A, so there's, there are lots of explanations of these phenomena that don't require you to overthrow basic causality in physics. Now, it's interesting that you found independently reason to doubt that our common sense Newtonian story of how, what, how causality works in physics is adequate for what we observe. Oh, no, so I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I, I think there's an interesting connection there too, but yeah. it looks like it's, it's a really big hammer to crack a walnut. Um, and I'm just wondering whether, what, what's your reply to that? Do you, do you not find that the standard cognitive scientific explanations of these phenomena except, uh, satisfying or do you think 
you're just pointing out there's a possible new candidate explanation and that's it. I think you make a very good general point. And there probably are lots of things. You could, there could be, you know, ESP phenomena, things I just wouldn't think twice about, you see. And people chat away about it and say, you we proved spirits or something. I don't know, goodness knows what. And I say, poo poo, that's just rubbish, you see. Whereas things like we were talking about here, and there may be, like with the Libet experiment, people would say, oh, well, the memory is wiped out and it's not, not part of long term memory, and therefore the person did experience it, and it's not that they somehow are un, 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 unexperienced it in some way, and there is another explanation. I would accept that as a possibility. I think I'm only putting here, maybe that's not the right answer. And I think it's worth, I mean, it's a, it's a delicate point, and I certainly, I agree with the point you're making. I think it's, it's very dangerous to say, oh, well, all these crazy things must be true because we can have uh, back referral, this uh, sort of retroactive behavior, and that solves all these crazy problems. And I think it's something you've got to be damn careful about. And I think, I think that's more or less what you're saying. No, but I do see that you're asking us to open our minds a little bit and say, well, there's a, the, you know, why not look here? Why assume yes. that? We yes. know that the, we have already have independent grounds for rejecting this naive causal story it, from quantum mechanics. So why not, and this is kind of a Pablo's lifelong point, why not take our best accounts of yeah. but I think the thing is, and you let it inform out the way that we provide psychological explanations. So I see that general point and I, I yeah. accept that, but I would, I, I'm glad you, you've expressed the same No, I certainly I absolutely take your point. But I think that if it weren't for the physics arguments, and they have to be looked at very carefully too, I mean part of the arguments which I gave you now only appears in the notes I sent around, it's not published. The thing that Donati had about the, when you take the amplitudes, the, the, the body is put into two locations. Right. And then you look at how special relativity talks about that. And I say the only way for the classical reality to behave is that the thing happened at the beginning. So you have to be retroactive about it. A more sort of sensible way of thinking about it would say, no, no, it's this CSL model that one fades out relative to the other. And you can make sense of that. It's still relativistically sensible until you combine it with the Donati argument, which wasn't in fact his argument, it's, it's a version of his argument. And I, I would have, it would take me a long time to go into that, but it does depend on these EPR type experiments, and you can send signals faster than light if it weren't for the fact that the reduction is not dependent on the amplitudes. I mean, it's, it's just to make a point about that, you see, you have these experiments where Alice and Bob, it's usually described in terms of Alice and Bob, they have, it takes a spin half particle and it starts with a spin zero state and then Alice chooses to measure the spin in a certain direction and then the description in ordinary quantum mechanics is that Bob instantaneously receives a thing with the opposite spin. Now if he could use those amplitudes, work out what they were by using the amplitudes if that influenced the time for the state reduction, then that could be an experiment he could perform and therefore work out what angle Alice had put the spin in and therefore send a signal faster than light. So there's a rather complicated involved logic in that, which people would have to look at carefully to see if there's a mistake in the logic. But the logic it seems to me pretty clear, which says that you've really got to go back to the beginning of the separation. But the point is that it's... it's there's a complicated story, and there could be mistakes in it, and it could be that I'm jumping to conclusions here and there, and as I say, this depends on results which are not published. I, I, mean, I, I don't, the, the idea that the, uh, the, the brain cortical stimulation erases the memory, I don't think that's been subjected to any rigorous test. No, no, it hasn't, no. But I mean, it's and, the and also, how would you explain the color file, which you meant the color file and the continuous rabbit? Or, or so, ben, Ben's results. I mean, those are all... Uh, well, if you have like a narrative theory of consciousness like Dennett does, then you could say we, we're, we're always, or even a predictive processing model, whatever, there we were always constructing these, the best explanation for the experiences we have or the stimulation we have. And as you get more data, you revise retroactively what you have experienced. So the story you would tell if you only got one tap of the cutaneous rabbit is one thing, but if you get multiple taps, you come up with a better story, and you pre, you post date the the times that you know, you, you make the you basically say at time t zero, 
I now have a different view about what I experienced, and that there isn't any fact of the matter independently of what stories you tell about it. But that consciousness has to be an illusion after the fact, and you don't have any real time consciousness. Yeah, well, now we're getting to a philosophical issue about whether or not the thing that causes you to tell that story, it might, might not be that your story it corresponds with reality, but that doesn't mean there's not a reality of consciousness that's re causing you to tell the story in the first place. So, so I think you can be wrong. There could be things that are up to us, uh, and that there isn't a matter of fact, but a matter of fact about, but we're still talking about a matter of fact. So, like we, the ancients were wrong about gold, right? Uh, they thought gold was a compound. They thought gold had alchemical essence, spirits in it, and but that doesn't mean they weren't talking about anything. And so, similarly, we can be wrong about consciousness or be f fabricating aspects of our conscious state or deciding to describe it one way or another. But that doesn't mean we're there's nothing no phenomenon, real phenomenon there that we're describing. So. Um, yeah, anyway, that's a, that's so, a different debate. Right. Right. Um, I, I think this debate should be going on over the, over the coming days and, and uh, hours and weeks and years to come. Uh, I'll, I'll make a quick comment in the end and then I think we'll hand it over to Basil. But basically to just point out in the way that I think the other way to think about it is also that we observe this type of phenomena elsewhere in nature, like you Ron yourself said. Completely separately from whether or not this has any role whatsoever to play in consciousness, it's perfectly valid, I think, to ask the question of, does this phenomenon occur in a human brain? So, it, and if it does, might it offer alternative pathways to explaining and understanding other phenomena? I think the other aspect, which is rather different, and one that I think Roger didn't raise so much, is that what are the faculties we use to actually experience the truth in the context of things like you know, statements like GR uh, in the system R, which we know to be true, but actually they're not provable in R. How, how do we do that? And are there any kind of structures that we might find in the brain and in the mind to do that? Because in a way, if you think about Orco R, it's sort of a, a pipeline mechanism to somewhere. And I'm sort of saying, well, there, there's lots of reasons to look at this question. Uh, let's talk about it. Um, Let's thank Sir Roger, and thanks everybody for great questions, and uh, let's hand it over to Basil. But thank you, Rod. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to keep the thumb there, and I'm terrible at it, so <laughs> if, if we're going to stay even vaguely in schedule, it's a miracle. Thank you, Demis, for. But I, I'm, I'm hoping that it was something similar to what Ron was going to say. Yeah. Which is my computer? I've lost track. I'll bring it to you. Thank you. So you're going to be on the next one. Yes. Thank you. That was a good point. Yeah. Let's put it inside. I have a pocket on top. I've got stuff in it, but I think that'll go in. Let's put it in here. Oh, okay. Come on. That's right. A little feather on the screen. On 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 television here, am I? That's all right. So let's let's figure it out. Okay. Sorry. I can bring you some. Could you bring what coffee some? with some sugar? Yes. Uh, what kind of espresso or, or uh, any, any just process? Just the ordinary coffee. Uh, yeah. With a bit of milk and a bit of... Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Uh, any, any water? No. no. Yeah. 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 You need to look in. Oh, okay.
Try my computer. I got a point. You're talking. Huh? It's, 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 I think it's, we got it. It's all in the hand now. Yeah, okay. I think I just did install Keynote oh. in like 30 seconds. So then that, that's the last step. Basil and this is, I think yesterday was really the first time in a couple of years that you, you've come out <laughs> to the world. Right? Yeah, that, that I've seen the civilized... Yeah, but you've had for a lot of people the same, yeah. yeah. I've seen a little bit Second. around my home. Yeah. yeah. Six kilometers. Yeah, no, it's, it's, quite, it's quite nice to have yeah. a lot of real people as opposed well, to... Well, I haven't, I haven't spoken to real people for ages. <laughs> My family are not real people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, All right. Okay. So and which Without is the picture I press here, or do I do Roger? So, so that's your remote. Yeah. yeah, well, Tristan, and I press to move it on here. Yep. Next one. Next one, and I go back that way. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Hey, you want to push it ahead? Yeah. All right. So I give you Basil Hailey. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here in the first place. And Roger, this, was, this, this talk is really aimed at some of the work that you've been doing, and I hope you will help me to clarify what I've been doing with them. Uh, and, and I love the sea, by the way. And this reminds me, I would, I'd like to be at the seaside at the moment. <laughs> But not in Finland with the weather. It's okay. Very close to it. Yeah. Okay. Are we? Oh. Okay. Well, uh, one of the things I hate is going first wicket down. If I can use a cricket analogy, because you never know what the spin bowlers are doing when you come on. You see, so you have to set the context yourself. So I've got to set a new context. Um, you know cricket, everyone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you, you guys don't. Um, no, never mind. <laughs> Yeah. So when Pavo told me about this conference, it was about consciousness. And I don't really know anything about consciousness. I'm, I'm either conscious or unconscious. And that's, but, but he persuaded me that information seems to be playing a key role, pointing me to the works of David Chalmers. And we, David Bohm and I, when we were looking at Bohm's theory, we had this rather strange thing called the quantum potential and we were trying to understand what it was doing. And we came to this idea that it was really talking about active information rather than forces. It was talking about active information. Is all right, Roger? Yes, I can see because... Oh, sorry, I'm in the way, yes. Are you all right there? Okay, because I... Okay, yeah, but I'm sorry, I, I, I walk... I walk and talk and do all sorts of funny things. That's what I was doing. Yeah, yeah thanks. Sorry, I, I don't know. No, no, it's not your fault. It's <laughs> sorry. Okay. Hold back for now. We will, we will reconfigure shortly. Okay, we'll okay. Hold back as you need. So let's uh, stay, stay yeah. the course for the moment. Okay. Now, as far as I know, Pavo is going to talk about active information in consciousness. He's the expert on that. I'm going to talk about quantum mechanics, because I don't understand quantum mechanics. Okay? I'll be quite honest with you from the beginning. Okay, so where did my story start? Well, it starts, actually, it starts earlier than that, when I was talking with Roger and David Bohm when I first got to Birkbeck College. And then we weren't talking about this theory at all, this Bohmian mechanics as it's now been called. 
That only came up later when a student came up to me and said, why don't you and David Bohm talk about the 52 paper? Okay. And, and, and I, I think I've got to say, note this, because very important, this factor of two in there. Right. So uh, I said, well, because David Bohm has shown it doesn't work. <laughs> de Bruyne says it's, it's no good. It's got difficulties with it. And yet everybody sells the Bohm, de Broglie Bohm theory as if it's the best thing since sliced bread. Okay, but the two people who actually created it said it's not good enough. It's only just a surface phenomenon. There's something deeper underneath. Uh, and when I looked at it, I said, my goodness, there is something deeper underneath. Because if you just look at the Schrodinger equation, you polar decompose, Schrodinger equations are complex numbers, turn it into its real and imaginary parts. And what do those, what do those tell you? Do they tell you anything different? And you look at the real part, and you find that if that was not there, that would just be a classical Hamilton-Jacobi theory. Classical physics, pure and simple. But I've, I've sneaked the S in there. It would be the action. In quantum mechanics, that turns out to be the phase. So we're looking at the phase in a dynamical situation where this now just becomes the, the conservation of energy provided this quantum potential is a new form of energy. So this would be the ki classical kinetic energy would correspond to. This would correspond to something new because it comes in with a factor H half. Okay? Now, for some reason or other, it was, it was controversial. And I think it might be because Heisenberg wrote in one of his books that Bohm is, oh, th that this potential is ad hoc. And Bohm is trying to make 2 plus 2 equals 5. Well, if you do a, an a, a pre-A level almost manipulation, you see a term in there, what your physicists always say, what does that mean? And that's what I was faced with. But why was it controversial? Then I found that through the history, in the 30s, it was used seriously. Fermi used it, Carl von Weizsäcker used it for, for physics purposes. Um, and in fact, Feynman found it in his lecture notes, you actually see in the volume three, it appears, and he calls it a mysterious quantum effect. And then nothing. But of course, some people, particularly when I get up to talk, say it's my nonsense. Well, it's nothing to do with me, it's in the equation, what does it mean? Okay. And just to show what you can do with it, if you want to, this is the the famous two-slit experiment, and you can actually see individual, the possibility of individual particles moving in this very strange fashion. And then you say, why is it doing that? Well, just calculate the quantum potential. Here are the two slits, and treat it just like a potential where the gradient of the potential gives rise to a force. When the electrons come along the, the top here, they don't experience any force, and you see straight lines corresponding to that. And then suddenly they hit one of these dips, and, and that's what causes the bunching. Okay, so this is totally different way of looking at it. But what does it mean? Okay, well, we then started looking at the quantum potential because I had some students there and the computers were not as nice as these, although I'm beginning to wonder whether these are nice now. Uh, you know, they were in a room with 150K, oh, fantastic. And I refused to operate computers in those days, so I said, no. But the students were just beginning to get their pack of cards and if they didn't drop them, they got good results. Right? And this came from that. And we looked at the uh, penetration of the barrier and all the paradoxes. And we found we could find a perfectly reasonable explanation. But then what did the, what did the, what did, what did the quantum potential tell us? It contains information about the experimental arrangement, about whether we've got two slits, three slits, how wide the slit is, how far apart they are, and how fast the, the electron is. It's got information packed in it. And so David Bohm and I had a, 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 a bit of an argument about whether we should call it information or not. 
But that, that's another story. He, he won, of course, he always, won, always wins. Um, but if you look at the force that it gives rise to, it's totally different from the classical force. Because if the V in the Schrodinger equation, that's a classical force which arises from some outside influence. This seems to be something to do with forming from within. And the nearest we get to it is something like the Coriolis force, the Magnus effect, or, the, or even the perihelion of Mercury. There's a paper by Robert Forward who actually shows that the same type of force that gives you the Coriolis force appears in general relativity. And then uh, it, Einstein also, when I was reading this, this paper, it's in English, fortunately, I saw it as a nice translation by Simon Saunders in this book, Philosophy of Vacuum. And he's translated Einstein's paper, and Einstein actually uses this word, pheronomy. Pheronom, phon, pheron, phonometry. Phon, phonometry, yes. I, no wonder it, it fell out of use. How <laughs> <laughs> you do? <laughs> and I tell a story of, of Pavo. There was a musician in, in the Helsinki Department of Musicology. Yeah, he used to follow me around. And I said, well, why is he following me around? Because I know nothing about music. And it turns out that this word is uh, a different word from the word that we use, but the, the musicologists use it. It's, it comes, let me, let me explain. We use the word kinetic, and that comes from the Greek kinos, which means movement when it's moved by pushing it. There is a thing called pharos, and pharos is a movement, period. Nothing pushes it, it's just coming from the movement itself. And, and, and Einstein had it, and he, he was wondering whether the uh, sunspots were actually not caused by electromagnetic effects, but by gravitational effects. But I don't think, I don't know whether that's gone any further than, did you know that he, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. No, but I, please, I'm always left field. Anything I say is from left field, but always genuine in the literature. Okay, so let me emphasize it's active information. It's not Shannon, not uh, quantum information. It's not fissure information, but people have tried to connect the quantum potential up with fissure information theory. And there are actually experiments, uh, expressions of that. So the, the thing is active. And the way David Bohm finally uh, convinced me that there may be something in it is because of the messenger RNA which has information stored in it. And today, of course, with coronavirus and the vaccines, people are using that. So that there is the activity. Uh, okay, now then, you see, our, our philosophy, if you like, came from trying to understand this quantum potential. But then people were trying to dismiss the quantum potential because it has non-local properties. It's all the properties you don't want. And... What I want to show here is that quantum potential is central to quantum field theory, in fact. And I discovered a paper by Bryce DeWitt. And look, same volume as David Bohm's 52 paper, issue four, not issue two. And this, I did not know about. Roger, did you know that Bryce DeWitt talked about the quantum potential? No, okay. No, it's fine. Does anybody else know that? I mean, I was amazed. I've been discussing this with David Bowman, all the crowd that we, we, we talked to, and nobody has mentioned this paper to me. I found it three or four weeks ago. So what's your talk? This is not a talk that I've given before. This is a brand new talk. And I'm still learning from it. First of all, he points out there's a local isomorphism between uh, canonical transformations in classical physics and a certain subgroup of all unity transformations. He's talking about the metaplectic group without mentioning it in name. And then he's saying uh, the method of constructing the quantum analogues is covariant under general coordinate transformations. 
And what does he do? He finds that you get the Schrodinger equation, you get the kinetic energy, he's putting the electromagnetic field in there. You get the kinetic energy, oh, sorry, the kinetic energy, you then get this h bar squared with a q, and he calls this q the quantum potential. Quantum me mechanical potential. So he's got this in his paper, and he says it's got to be there. Otherwise you don't have a covariant Schrodinger equation. Okay, so what does he do? Well, what he simply does is he changes all C numbers, those are numbers that compute with each other, into what we in physics call operators, but I'd rather follow Dirac and call them Q numbers. Because they then def define an algebra which satisfies this relationship here. Uh, and you have the usual, and the point, the problem is with the, getting the classical, getting the C numbers out, you cannot have X and P simultaneously, and we get into all those problems of representation. Okay, good. But now what DeWitt actually did was to ask, what happens if you make your momentum, your, 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 your metric a function of position, as you would in general relativity, for example? You're going to a curved space time. And then what he sh showed was that you have to introduce this delta function. These are two different points, not two different representations. So they, he's dealing with two-point functions, just as Singe was dealing with two-point functions in his general relativity. But it turns out that this is just the Green's function of Schwinger. And uh, what you get is the relation between this delta function has this extra factor, dec g, the determinant, and that's well known in circles. Then what he shows is that he actually gets an expression in terms of the Christoffel symbols. Oh, sorry, the point I also want to make is that it, rather than just replacing P by this thing, you have to replace the P by that minus this extra correction factor of the contracted Christoffel symbol. And then you find that the Q is related to a scalar curvature. A scalar curvature of what? Okay. Second story. I was looking in the literature, how many people have actually spotted this? And there's a guy called Delfinich, who I know has done a lot of translations of de Broglie's work. He's worked with de Broglie. And he came to the conclusion that the quantum potential, here it is, is related to scalar curvature. I didn't quite, it, 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 the way he does it is a little bit funny. And then I found in your, one of your papers the zero rest mass that you added scalar curvature. Six, yes. But did you know that was the quantum potential? No. Okay, <laughs> good. And then my friend Morris de Gosson, who has really taught me everything I know about symplectic structure, symplectic geometry, he had a very strange proof of, that saying that if you take the short time, that is the glass, classical propagator, it will satisfy Schrodinger's equation provided you take this term away. So in other words, this term is giving rise to the, he, he called it causality in, in the Schrodinger equation. But it's not classical causality, it's a causality in there. Okay, so we've got a curvature. And, the question then is geometry of what? What is the geometry? Are we getting close to general relativity or not? Well, what it turns out is that the classical Hamilton Jacobi has these constant surfaces of action, change that into constant surfaces of the phase in the quantum mechanic, and you want to know whether these are curved or not, so you use the Weingarten map, doesn't matter about the technicality, but by moving the normal around, you can get information about the curvature. And therefore, what we're looking at are the actual uh, curvature of the hamilton jacobi surfaces. Okay? But notice that this defines the, the dynamics. It's both the phase and the amplitude 
that are playing a vital role in the unfolding process, as Dirac called it. Okay, well, is this reasonable? Well, we know how to get the Schrodinger equations out of a variation of standard quantum mechanical treatments. And we get two by that, and it's very important. This just looks, oh, but it's only the complex conjugate. It's not adding anything new. When you go to higher uh, relativity, you've got to watch. Okay. Uh, oh, Is that me back again? No, I've got one more. Okay. Roger, it's not easy to do this, is it? <laughs> oh, I meant to move that. Can I just go on, to just ignore that for a minute? And then what, what I did was just simply, it, it, it's done elsewhere in the literature, it's nothing unique, was to change this into the polar decomposition, do the variation, and I get these two equations, which are identical to the Bohm equations. But I just want you to note that we've got little arrows, so one is left and one is right, and we've actually got two algebras. Okay, then look at the energy, and we find that the Bohm momentum, the guidance condition, as the Bohmian mechanics call it, comes out of the energy momentum tensor, the fourth component, fourth uh, zero, zero component is the energy. So what I've really done now, I've slipped into a field theory because I'm looking at a, a field rather than a particle. And then where's the quantum potential? Well, it's in the uh, trace of the energy momentum tensor. There it is. So it's certainly there. Now then, you can, and then you can do the same for the uh, Dirac, and, and, which I'll come to that in just a minute. Now, what's the relation with quantum mechanics? Well, if you integrate over T naught J, you find this is the quantum mechanical momentum. Integrate uh, over all space. If you integrate it at T naught naught over all space, you get the, that's the quantum energy. But if you integrate this thing here, this new momentum, it's zero. So you don't see it in quantum mechanics. So it's hidden underneath the statistical averages. Can we exploit that? It's obviously the thing that's in the back of my mind. Okay, now then. What about the Pauli and Dirac particles? That is particles to satisfy Pauli equation and the Dirac equation. Because we're now bringing in spin and we're now bringing in relativity. You'll see in the literature people saying, oh, Bohm's theory doesn't work because they can't do spin and relativity. Rubbish. They already did spin Pauli in 50-something. But nobody bothers to read those papers. But what, what I did was to realize, because of Roger pushing me into, into Clifford Algebra, because it was when you, in your Twister lectures that you used to, I used to sit in, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about until I discovered Clifford. And, uh, and then I, I said, oh, that's a way of trying it. Okay, so what we do then, remember Hamel, uh, Hamel uh, Dirac just simply linearized a quadratic form and that Clifford House is all about linearizing quadratic forms. And then what you find is something very interesting. And that is that if you look at these Clifford algebras, you can get a hierarchy of them. Well, bot periodicity says it stops at eight. So then it's just repeated with a slight modification to it. You don't know anything new. We've got the Schrodinger equation. This naught G um, here, that's one plus in your metric. That's three negatives. That three pluses, there's something interesting between the signature of the metric and these Clifford algebras. And if you look at the ones I've chosen, here you've got the uh, complex numbers coming in, here you've got the uh, Pauli spin matrices coming in, here you've got the gamma matrices coming in, and up the top here is Rogers Tristus. Now, what I noticed, or what someone told me to notice, 
was that you don't need to use wave functions in this algebra that, that uh, De Witt has looked at. What we need are elements of a mineral left ideal. So in the dynamical algebra, the information that's carried in the wave function is actually carried in the algebra itself. And it's carried in itself. This is why, I, remember, we had a bit of a tussle over the quaternion. I don't know whether you remember that, Roger, because you have so many visitors and so on. You remember what I said. But we got into a bit of a scrap about the quaternions. Just take it as... This is what Dirac, what, what Clifford found. And please remember for people who don't know the history that Dirac, uh, Clifford did this before quantum mechanics was even thought about. So this came out of classical physics, not. And yet here we are using these things. And why is it? Surely there's something, there's something odd going on here, which I didn't understand. And then... Yes, the way Dirac did it was to introduce a blank symbol here. And he called this the standard ket. Now, please, this is not the ket that we normally use, that I've used in the previous slides. It's a very special ket, the standard ket. Did he teach you that when you went to his lectures? I seem to remember him talking about standard kets, but I don't what you were saying. <laughs> you don't, did, did you take any notice of that standard ket? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, I'm curious, because I found that when we made the standard cat into an operator, I got an idempotent which enabled me to create all these... I'm afraid my memory of what he said in those lectures... Okay, yeah, no, I'm, 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 just, I'm, sorry, I'm just asking, because this, this standard cat is completely lost from the literature. Uh -huh. No, I remember talking about standard cats. So. Yeah, but the standard cats are the idempotents that I want to, to construct minimum left ideals. So I get different representations if I take it. What, uh, let me show you. And that's why I put, we, we have to be careful about the arrows, whether we're operating from oh, multiplying, 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 because we're dealing with non-commutative structures. OK, here's a list of results that, uh, that uh, Bob Callaghan and I published. So here's the wave function, equivalent to the wave function where the gammas are the elements of the Clifford algebra and the g's are just function of space and time. So here's the Dirac, Pauli, Schrodinger, and I have to choose idempotents to do this. If I want a different representation, these, these go to the usual representation we use in physics. If I want a different representation, I choose a different idempotent. And then here's the, the paper that we published. And this shows you how you relate the wave functions to the g's. So instead of having this, we have these elements of the left ideal. OK. And then the Schrodinger equation, you see, it gives us these two elements. So we're looking all the time at the dynamics defined by this non-commutative structure. And then, just to finish it off, we then Instead of the wave function, we've got this density, which is normally called a density matrix. And for the pure state, we write it just simply as that. And we get two equations, but the equations now are in terms of a commutator and an So I've got a, 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 a commutator and a Jordan product. And the Jordan product is something which gives us the energy and which people in physics don't talk about. And then you find that you get three quantum potentials. One for the Dirac, one for the... So the quantum potential is there in all of these structures. OK. So. Now, remember that if, we go, if we're changing from C numbers to Q numbers, we're really going to quantum... There must be some connection with quantum field theory. And so that means we need to turn the amplitude, that's the amplitude of the wave function, and this is the phase of the wave function, into Q numbers. And the way you do that is by changing the wave function into an operator, and then you get these annihilation and creation operators. And I never understood why they did that. Now I know, 40 years later, 
the connection between the general structure. And then we find that we, can, we have actually created the bosonic creation annihilation operators and believe it or believe it not, this is what Heisenberg did in his book way back in the 30s. It, this is the English translation. My, my German is, not, is, is, is useless. And uh, uh, again, Dirac found exactly the same results. Very interesting paper this. But we've now moved from a single particle theory to a many particle theory because we're allowing energy and creation, energy to, uh, particles to be created. So we're really generalizing the whole Bohm approach, but keeping some of the physical ideas, or the metaphysical ideas perhaps would be a better way of putting it. Okay, now why is this working? Well, it's a fact that if you look at a Clifford algebra, you can generate it. it it's really a combination of a, a, a Grassmann algebra and its dual. And the Grassmann algebra and its dual are essentially these are the things that are playing that role. But, and, and it's in the orthogonal. But what we haven't got, no, sorry, that's the uh, uh, symplectic. And we've therefore got the fermionic, I'm sorry, I've got this wrong. It's the fermionic Grassmann, and these are boson, bosonic, because they, they commute with each other. So why should we expect two, two sets of operators to be it, it, it's basic in the mathematical structure I'm dealing with. It not has to be added like I, I've been taught. And then you've got two algebras, and you can create annihilation operators in the paper that I did with David Bohm in, where's the reference to it? Don't worry about the details, I'm just trying to get the idea across. And this is a paper that uh, Bohm, and I'm almost ashamed to direct people to that paper because it's got too many mathematical errors in it. This is a different way of doing it, which is actually much, much safer. So now we've got, we've got our annihilation creation operators of the two types. And the interesting thing about the Clifford algebra is that the Clifford product, so you've got to change the nature of the product. The product now is our scalar product with a minus sign in front of it and a cross product for those people who know about vectors. But that turns into a scalar and a bivector. So the interesting thing is, where does this bivector come from? But then we need another mathematical result, which is the unitary group is an intersection of these three groups. That's the orthogonal group, so that's what I've been talking about with the orthogonal Clifford algebra. That's the symplectic group, which I was talking about with the Heisenberg algebra. And we, this is the I, for me, the I doesn't come from the, from the story you tell, Roger, although you, I hope you will tell me exactly. It comes from the almost complex structure, which is the symplectic two-form. It's your epsilons AB, from which you construct. I mean, you've done all this. You've, are, you, are you happy with that? Carry on. Okay, he doesn't see it. Uh, and then what we can do, and this is where we had the argument, if you take the Clifford product, you actually find that you get the right relativistic metric. It's got to be the Clifford product, not the product that, that, that you use there. Okay, so what we seem to have in here, but there's something more. And that is that we can actually choose a J or I to be any direction in space. And then I go to Vince's work, who really, uh, I, I knew this a long time ago, but I couldn't fit it all together. And this is taken from one of Vince's transparencies, um, where you, you take the quaternions and you split the quaternion into a complex space and a two-dimensional space. The two-dimensional space is the phase space, essentially, we'll show that. And the particular direction is the direction of I, so you can take any direction in this space to fill the whole of the space up. And then what you find is that on this space, you have a, a, a symplectic form, and that is the 
phase space. This is very simple electromagnetic theory. You've got the electric vector and the, and the magnetic vector of this plane, and this is just taking the polarization forward in that. But this works for all quantum mechanics. Okay, and you then, for a, a, a given, it's just given to you, you've got immediately got the Heisenberg group in there. So you've got the main contributes to the quantum mechanics is already in this mathematical structure. Now, I knew about this a long, long time ago. One of the first papers I wrote with Fabio Fascura, I was asking you whether you met him or not. He was, he was my research. He, he taught me a lot. <laughs> so always judge a good research student by the amount they teach you. And what you can do is you can take those vectors. Oh, let me put the other slide up. You can take these vectors. That's, that's the vectors that I'm talking about on the previous transparency. And it's actually what Roger does in his book. And this V3 is his, he's got a, uh, a, a spinner picture with a flag and a flag plane and you can map that onto there so that the V3 and the thing I've been doing is the flagpole, v 3s here and then the flag plane if you project it down onto this orthogonal space you find it appearing there and if you want to, the relation between what I do and what Roger does is just there so I've come to this from a very different direction. I think you came to it by saying, I want the spinner to be more fundamental. And you make space and time. I came through the space and time and showed that underlying that, provided I make the steps that I have made and arrive full circle at Roger's work. Okay. And, and that's, this is brand new work, by the way, so it, it might be wrong. I, I've, I, I've only worked it out two or three weeks ago. And I realise I have to go back to Roger's lectures in the Battelle Royal Contra in 1986, where I first read this. And I see a lot more connections with what I'm doing. But I've only got... Have I been over time? So let me just conclude. OK? Now, what I think... I, what I, what I'm, I'm arguing for is that the quantum potential energy is central to quantum fields. It's central to the whole subject. Looking at it in terms of active information, is this going to help us take anything further? Pavel will be talking about consciousness. I'm not, I, I know nothing, as I said I've earned earlier. Pavel will do all that. So I've legitimized from the physics point of view what Pavel, I hope, is going to talk about. And I've talked briefly, I haven't said anything really about active information, but Pavel will tell us all about that. Okay. So in the early days, this was talking about uh, low energy, therefore single quanta. But I moved it to field theory. And it's in field theory that if you go to the two-particle Schrodinger equation, where you've got an entangled state, you've already got the non-locality that everybody finds mysterious, I find it mysterious as well, please don't get me wrong. And you actually find it in the quantum potential. So the quantum potential I looked as an explanation, provided we understood what the quantum potential was, of the einstein rosen podolsky non-locality. And, uh, and because of the idea of information, David Bohm suggested that there is this thing called a pool of common information which these two particles are responding to which and do, the information doesn't travel there is a locking together and I've often wondered whether this is the, en the same energy that Bondi was talking about that Roger talks about the non-local notion of energy whether you can actually local, whether you can actually do everything in the continuum, and then if you want to see, look at the non-locality here. This is by Chris Judney, was that you've got an entangled pair here in the conventional language. You've got a stern girl arc, which is where you measure this. You switch the field on on one magnet. 
no field on the other magnet. You can put these magnets wherever you like and however far apart they are. The magnetic field gets the spin up in this direction and without any field the opposite particle has spin. It develops, you can see it developing in time. Extraordinary. But this is the same you were saying, it's extraordinary, where the hell does it come from? Now, the other thing is that, uh, oh, well, this is, I've said this before in the beginning, yeah. The other interesting thing is that you can, you use everything that I've used in the superconductivity, but there you find that the, this particular form of the wave function, r e to the i s, comes from an expectation value, and this expectation value then gives you the behavior of the uh, superfluidity, and you can watch it as the temperature changes, and you can watch the, the thing behave. There's a lot of experiments done on that. Now, for, for, for consciousness, the, the, the other day I was asked to, to try and say something about consciousness, and I had an experience, had a very serious illness where I was drifting in and out of consciousness and they thought I'd almost gone. And the surprising thing there was that suddenly I woke up and I was, I wanted to get out of the bed, but I was in the intensive care unit and they wouldn't let me get up. Uh, and I said, why? I'm, I'm perfectly all right. What's the problem? And that sudden appearance of consciousness from that. Is this, is this common experience, Stuart? For people to wake up from... From, from almost not... Because I was bleeding internally. Uh -huh. And then suddenly it stopped. And you wake up. Well, that, I wake up. That's a good thing. I know it's a good thing, yeah. But I say... <laughs> but the, the, I, I had that experience of... Drifting in and out. God, my kids, who's going to look after that? And, oh, I couldn't care less. And then, you know, going away again. And then suddenly, there's a sudden transition. And I wondered whether it was anything to do with the second order phase transitions, which I'd worked on for my PhD. Because there you do have below a certain range, temperature range. So this will bring temperature in without having to get your microtubules to do it for you. It could be that the blood supply was returned to your brain and adequate. Yeah, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, no, I agree. But I'm just saying, could it be worth exploring whether it's this quantum phenomenon that you guys are trying to think about? Coming out of this particular way. Look, what, I, what I'm actually trying to say, I don't believe there is a collapse of any... Oh, with television. Any wave function. Because I don't, with this way of doing it, you don't need the wave function to describe quantum mechanics. It's all done through this algebra if you're willing to take it seriously. Then your explanation that you were talking about just, just now dawned on me. The separation is taking place because of the algebra, not because of the wave function. The wave function is an algorithm which has been absolutely brilliant. But it's an algorithm which the underlying reality is not like that. It's, it don't build an ontology out of the wave function, is, is, is what I'm, I think I'm saying. Build it out of the dynamics. Okay, the other thing of course is the, the connection with the, uh, with the Rogers work and then some other thermal. So you can have quantum mechanics in a thermal situation. So you don't have to worry too much unless you've got some reasons why you worry about it. But you could, with, with the quantum field theory, you can have it at different temperatures. You can have quantum mechanics still being coherent at different temperatures. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Basil. Okay. Uh, Due to technical problems, we're a tiny bit late. So here's what I propose we do. We start thinking about having lunch, and all the questions and chat with Basil can take place over lunch, which is happening, I don't know, 20 meters that way. Okay. And that way we can then sort of be well-nourished for Hugh to come, uh, come and talk to us about 
I think I sense maybe something completely different. But uh, I think there's lots of questions. I suggest that we take them over there while you grab lunch and we all sit down and, and keep talking. Does that, does that work? That's fine with me. Thank yeah. you very yeah, much. Just a practical note, during the lunch break, anyone who needs the COVID test for the travels, uh, many of the people have already contacted you and have to sign up uh, connected. Uh, but if there's anybody else who would also need a uh, COVID certificate for the travels, uh, that's right around the corner. Uh, that's kind of cool. that's yeah. So find your own if you need a COVID test. Exactly. Well, we've got to have one. Yes. You do, right? You do, do. Anyone getting to have one?